in its important cause. Now, the impact of the financial crisis, it's clear that China has come through and come through better than most. And if it were not so, we in Australia would certainly be in trouble. But there are some new considerations, including the following. Since the 19th century, China has sought wealth and power. Uh, over the last 20 years, at least, wealth and power have most been exemplified by the United States. So China has calculated that it needs at least 20 years of peace and cooperation with the US while it catches up. And people in the West have calculated that they have about that amount of time in which to bring China into the sort of global community that suits us and suits our interests. Um, but now Iraq and Afghanistan have shown the limitations of US power in the global financial crisis with its origin in the sub -loans, subprime loans crisis in the US has done the same for US wealth. So there are those in China who are beginning to question uh, the basis of China's relatively compliant behavior vis-a-vis -vis the West, and particularly the US. Now, now this is not yet and, and may not become mainstream thinking in China, but it's food for thought. And there is certainly a debate, going, an important debate going on in China about uh, how powerful is the United States, how long is the United States going to remain num number one. So that should also be food for us. The window we thought we had may not be open for as long as originally predicted. Other new elements impacting on China's foreign policy making include nationalistic popular opinion, including in particular uh, that expressed by angry netizens, the famous Fenqing. Although one thing about Fenqing is they do grow older like everybody else. Uh, but some years back, Chen Chen was asked by a student at Beida what he thought was the greatest contradiction in Chinese foreign policy. And he replied, that between China's rational policies and popular opinion. Now this can be overstated, and sometimes Chinese embassies use this as an all too facile excuse for policies that embarrass the more intelligent of them. We had some problems in this regard in Australia um, last year with the Rabia Kabir visit and film. But it's still, it is an issue uh, in a way which was not the case previously. Chinese policy makers, not just foreign policy makers, do have to take into account public, public opinion. You look at the way public opinion concerns play their part in the way which the uh, Chinese government uh, is handling the, uh, the current kerfuffle with Japan over the Diaoyu Island decision. Another relatively new issue, uh, which Jill has already mentioned, is China's interest in soft power and the impact of international reputation on China's global standing. A, a third new development is the beginnings of a reinterpretation of the time-honored doctrine of non-interference in the affairs of other countries. Uh, when you see Chinese foreign policy scholars talking about proactive non-interference, you realize something's going on. Uh, what's going on, of course, is that China is discovering that as it acquires great power status, it's having to take on a series of new responsibilities. Life becomes more complicated, and the expectations of others, as well as one's own people, also rise. All this means it's no longer feasible to treat the domestic and international as two totally different arenas. So globalization and China's increasing presence mean that just as international developments impact on China's domestic situation, so domestic developments in China are of increasing importance internationally. And there's another complicated issue, that China's foreign policy is becoming, well, more complicated, uh, by which I mean that there are more players and the various lines of decision-making and authority are increasingly unpredictable, not that it was ever all that clear. But it's less so now as Chinese society becomes less monolithic, different interest groups emerge, the power of the central government to impose a clear and consistent uh, policy line is not what it was. Now, I'm talking here about groups such as powerful central ministries, for instance, the Ministry of Commerce versus the Ministry of Finance and the People's Bank of China on the subject of the revaluation of the yuan, state-owned enterprises, for instance, in Iran, the nuclear industry, uh, for instance, pressure for a new reactor for Pakistan. Uh, the PLA, a series of statements over the past year from fairly senior PLA figures uh, that are clearly out of sync, at least with some of the things the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has been saying. Powerful local governments, uh, Chinese netizens again, and so on. So if things go wrong, don't necessarily blame the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, although I have to say that uh, uh, their public statements don't always help and perhaps sometimes about even the form of counts soft power, there are always going to be issues between the message you convey to your own people and the message you convey overseas. And sometimes messages which are designed to meet domestic interests are reinterpreted in a different way overseas. This is something that, that you know, all foreign ministries have to come to grips with. I suggest that China maybe have to go, it's got a little way to go. 
uh, more than ever, though, in order to judge how China is going to behave internationally, we need to know as much as possible about what's happening domestically. Of course, it's crucial to follow closely the evolution of strategic and foreign policy thinking, trade and investment policies, China's position on climate change, and so on. But these things don't occur in a vacuum, uh, and less than ever before, because China is developing so rapidly. Uh, less than ever before, can we continue to, uh, can we afford to ignore the official and unofficial debates and struggles that characterize China today? And beneath the surface appearance of harmony and united purpose, uh, China is the scene of great intellectual ferment and contention, both within and without the confines of the party. And frankly, some of the most interesting debates are going on within the party. Uh, something, again, which, which uh, uh, some foreign observers tend to, tend to neglect. As I've said, almost all thinking Chinese uphold the classic wealth and power goals that date back to, uh, at least back to, back to the young Yahoo self-strengthening uh, movement in the mid 19th century. But how you define them, how you get there, what you do when you get there, if you get there, these are all open to question. And while some at the top might like to try to keep things as they are, just about all Chinese I know at least agree that while they don't know exactly what China is going to look like in 20 or 30 years from now, they're pretty sure it's going to be different, at least as different as China today is from China 30 years ago. Uh, interestingly, that makes China rather different from India, uh, where most people who look at India expect that it will be pretty much the same sort of country as it is, as it is now. And that actually has an impact on, on foreign perceptions. The question is not just about the rise of China, but what sort of a China. So debates about democracy and political reform, reappraisals of China's own history, the remarkable revival of China's own, uh, of interest in China's own classical tradition with all its ambiguities, uh, partly but by no means exclusively encouraged by the state, the religious revival, Christianity but still more strikingly of Buddhism, the growth of environmental consciousness, the emergence of, at times, virulent nationalism, all these things and more need to be factored into how we think about the implications of a rising China. Is China a status quo? Yes, it is. Uh, and no, it isn't. Uh, yes, it is, because it's not trying to overthrow the existing world order. It has no intention of playing a spoiling role. The global system has worked well for China years of opening reform, and it's become increasingly involved in the system in myriad ways. It's not the former Soviet Union, it has no plan to subvert the world or to impose a China model on others. But at the same time, it's equally disputable that as a country of China's size and weight becomes ever more involved in global affairs, that cannot but change the way things are. Whatever China's own subjective intentions or protestations, peaceful and constructive intent. So however we regard the rise of China, be it with complacence, alarm, hope, fear, concern, sympathy, greed, we can hardly be indifferent. Whatever our views, we must at least agree it's going to be a major challenge for the rest of us, and at this point probably most of all for the United States, still the global superpower, the sole global superpower. How the US reacts to the rise of China will itself have an impact, quite possibly a significant impact, on China's trajectory. But our own, I'm here on talking about Australians, reactions are also not without importance, and perhaps uh, some of you may have read uh, the recent quarterly essay by Professor Hugh White, of the ANU on just this subject and its implications for Australia. Now, you may not agree with everything that Hugh says, but what he writes about is of fundamental importance, certainly for Australia, but also it's pretty important for China and the US as well. After the bilateral problems of last year or more, things seem to be settling down, at least for the time being, with uh, visits of Deputy Premier Li Keqiang last year and uh, Vice President Xi Jinping more recently. There's much in this relationship for both sides, and China is going to be increasing importance for Australia. But it won't always be plain sailing. But let me repeat that rather than rising, China is coming back. And for the first time, our major trading partner is not our major security partner or a strategic adjunct to our major security partner. For all our neighbors except New Zealand and Asia dominated by China is the historical norm. But for us in Australia, it's uncharted territory. So we're going to have to be smart. But at the same time,